morning, good morning. Happy Sabbath. Sabbath. Take off my mask. Ooh, hello, hello friends. Friends of the family. Okay. First thing I want to say is I hope you brought your Bibles because today you're going to be reading it aloud. If you don't have a physical one, there should be one in the pews. And if you don't, we got things like this. Right? We got these things. How many of you have one of these? For all the other older aunties and uncles, you have flip phones, I'll be praying for you, but it still applies. These things are crazy. They're amazing. Now, I wasn't privileged enough to uh, witness the transition between flip phones and internet, uh, like crazy big phones. I think the first one was like the Blackberry with the keyboard on the bottom and they had internet. That's pretty cool. And while these things are cool, um, What's the first thing you do when you buy one of these? You, uh, you plug it in, right? You give it some juice, some power. Without power, uh, what is this good for? Pretty much nothing, right? A paper, aha, a paperweight. If it gets windy, you got a paperweight. If you're trying to get, if you're getting attacked, you can throw it at someone, but that's about it. The main purpose of what it's created for is now useless. I want to say something crazy, and hopefully you go along with me, but what if I were to say that our lives are a lot like this phone? What do I mean? For those who have these phones, or any, actually any phone, how many times do you charge your phone a day? Once? How many can go a whole day charging your phone once? Anyone? Maybe twice? Charging your phone twice. How many can go twice, right? How many of you can go charging your phone? How many times? Three times charging your phone. Anyone? Okay, how many of you have chargers in your car? Right? How many of you guys have the little like boxes to help get your phone going? Those like battery packs, right? For me, I didn't bring it, but I have a case on my phone that charges it wherever I go. I'm that lazy, I don't wanna plug it in. I wanna carry it with me. Um, I also do a lot, so pray for me for that because it, it dies a lot. Um, but why do we do that? Why do we charge our phones? Because we know we won't be able to make it, we won't be able to connect with the people around us, the family, the friends, the people across the country, if at first we're not giving power to these things, they're not plugged in. You plug it in once and it dies, the thing you're going to use it for is now useless. In the same way for us, our connection to God is through prayer. I don't want you to raise your hands, but how many times have you connecting that power source more than once in your day or twice or anything like that. Our connection to God, to that power source, to that living power is through prayer. That's what we're talking about today. We're talking about, the, about prayer. So first, let's begin with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for this day. I ask that you be with us as we open your word. Um, and we get a better understanding as how to commune with you, what that means, and um, how to get back to getting power from you daily. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, amen. What is the first, what is the point of prayer? Why do we pray? I've heard it once said that prayer is giving permission to God to enter into our lives. Literally saying I'm giving you permission. I'm allowing you to come into my life and guide me. Now, how do we know that? How do we know that God isn't just barging in saying, ah, it's me, King of Jerusalem. I'm here to do my job. How do we know that? Well, let's go to the last book of the Bible, Revelation. Revelation chapter 3. If you're there, say amen. Revelation chapter 3. This gives us a better picture of what Jesus is like and how exactly he's a gentleman. Revelation chapter 3. If you're there, say amen. Amen. Okay. We got one. We got one person. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. If you know it, great. Even if you know it, we're going to read it together. 320. It says, Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with them. And he with me. Does it say here that he's breaking down the door? Is that what it says? 
It says that he's knocking, right? Does it say that he's going to knock and then open it? No, what does it say? It says, if they hear me, hear my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with them. How many of you have those friends in your life where you can go into their house uh, unannounced? You can just walk in, um, make some food, maybe take a nap on the couch, take a shower, and uh, they're fine with it. Anyone have, anyone have those friends that, you, that you're fine with that? Any of you are those friends? You can go in someone's house, right? Now, the first time you met someone, could you have done that the first time? Walk in, like, hi, nice to meet you. I'm going to take a shower real quick. Could you have done that? Or like cook a, cook a meal for yourself and then just leave? No, right? You had to build up to that. You had to create a relationship. In the same way, that's how it is with the Jesus. We're creating that relationship. At first, we're letting him in, and we're not just kind of standing there, all right, Jesus, come in, and then sitting there, just twiddling with our fingers, like, all right, uh, what are you doing here, Jesus? It's more than that. It's more than just letting him in. So we're going to talk about that. Second Chronicles. The Old Testament again, Second Chronicles chapter 7, while you're getting there. Um, I'm going to talk about, at times when we let Jesus into our lives, we're, like, we're saying, Lord, come into my life. Lord, close these doors, open these doors. And then we have our, our hand on the door handle. Like, Lord, if, if you want me to uh, open this door so I can get to this job or close the door so I can leave, and we're holding the door. And Jesus is saying, do you really want me to, to help? Like, what's going on here? It's more than that. So 2 Chronicles chapter 7. We're going to be here for a while, so if you're not there yet, it's okay. Take your time. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. It says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and what? And pray. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and and pray. Let's stop there. What does humbling yourself mean? What does it actually mean? Let's say you have a nice car. You have a nice house. You have the newest phone, iPhone 16, 17, I don't know where we're at. Uh, the newest phone or the newest watch or shoes. Those are all great things. Cool. That's awesome. But Jesus, at this moment in our life, while we're communing with him, He's saying, I don't care about those things. I'm not focused about those things right now. What I'm focused about is the me and you, that one-on-one -on -one connection. I want the you that no one else knows about. Not the social media you, not the you that you put up when you're going to the grocery store. I'm so happy. I'm just getting my fruit, my expensive fruit. Um, not, the, not the you that you, you're at work where you're like, oh, I love this job, except her. He, he doesn't want that you. He wants the you without those things, the humbling yourself you. That's what that means. He's saying, those things are great, but I want just you. And on your end, that's saying, Lord, I know I have all these things. And when you're at work, when you're at school or whatever, you can show off those things. Those are great. But this time, that's putting those things aside, taking off of that crown, laying it down and saying, Lord, I come to you humble. I'm humbling myself. Let's keep reading. Same verse, it says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. Praying, we talked about, is that communing, that talking with God. It says, And seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Uh oh. There's more steps to it than just humbling myself? Uh oh. Humbling myself is already hard. I have to take off my nice shoes. I have to. Uh, put away my new phone, my new computer. I have to get out of my car. I have to do all these things and just be me? I have to do more than that? That's crazy. That's what it's saying. But what does that mean to seek? I really hope she's not watching. If she is, hi, I love you. My girlfriend loses things all the time. It's insane. She loses things all the time. I mean, I do too. And the worst part of it is we both have the worst memory. We don't have a recollection of where we left the things last. So she asked me, where'd you last put it? I don't know. If I ask her, where'd you put it? She's like, I don't know. It's the hardest thing to find things wherever we're, we're loose stuff. And um, when we lose things or when you guys lose things, do you kind of just stop? 
searching for stuff? No, right? How many of you lost something maybe the day that you need it? You lost your keys the day you're going out for a drive. Anyone lose things like that the day of you need it? How many of you lost something 10 minutes before you need it? Maybe like your computer is gone or you actually need to go on for a drive. Or maybe it's like five minutes before you need it and it's still a loss. Are you going to go into the room and just be like, uh, oh, not here, and then leave, right? You're not going to do that. You're going to move things around. You're going to actively seek for it, seek what was lost, right? That's what it means when he says here to seek his face. We're not, we're not going into a room, like I said, and just saying, ah, it's not here. We're moving stuff around, moving furniture. We're testing our friends' uh, uh, friendships, and we're saying, empty your pockets. You might have it. Maybe your keys are my keys, you know? We're not stopping until we find those things. In our prayer life, a way that may look like is saying, if someone says, I'm having a rough time, and someone mentions, pray about it. And you say, Lord, help me with this thing. Amen. Well, nothing happened. That's what that looks like. That's not how it works. We don't just pray something and then say, ah, it's not working. We continue that. Continue that relationship. But it doesn't end there. It says, Turn from their wicked ways. Seek my face. Turn from their wicked ways. Wicked. Are you thinking to yourself, I'm not wicked? What does that mean? I mean, I, I have my devotions every day. I'm not wicked. I pray every day. I'm not wicked. I go to church every Saturday. I'm not wicked. I go to Bible study. I have so many verses memorized. I'm not wicked. Just because no one else knows about it doesn't mean it's not there. Whatever that may mean for your life, just because no one else knows about it, doesn't mean it's not there. So turning from your wicked ways, another way to say that is repent. Now repent, you might think it's like a big word, so I'll make it easy for you. Repent means you're going this way, and it means to turn away and now walk this direction. That's what repent means, to turn away from those things and to walk back. So when God is saying to turn from your wicked ways, it's saying you're going this way, but now I want you to go this way. I want you to, to turn back from whatever those things are. Whatever those things that are replacing my time, I want those things to be turned away. Now, I won't lie. Um, some days it's really easy just, uh, let me see what time it is. Oh, Instagram. <sighs> it's really easy to do that, to check everything else on your phone except being plugged in. You're saying, oh, yeah, my phone's 100% charged. I'm not. That's fine. I can last the whole day. And you go on your whole day. I'm pretty guilty of that. But it's turning away from that. It's maybe getting up actually out of bed and putting your phone somewhere else and spending that time with God. That's what it means. So here are the steps. It says humbling ourselves is the first step, right? Humble ourselves. We need to pray to seek his face and turn from the wicked ways. You may be thinking, oh, that's so many steps, so much to do. What am I going to get out of it? That's what us humans do. Always ask what we can get out of things. But let me show you the, the, the ending of this verse. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven. From where? From heaven. And will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Is this saying he will hear us from like the roof of the church? Is that what he's saying? From the roof of our houses? Being honest, how many of you guys at times feel like your prayers are so weak, they're just, there's no way they can go all the way to heaven? There's no way. It's hitting the roof. I, I can't. There's no way. He's saying, from heaven I will hear them. You know what comes next after the hearing? The healing. It says, I will hear them and I will heal their land. Now, healing comes in different ways for, for each of us. Healing can come from a bad relationship. You can have healing from a bad job experience. You can have healing from a loss in the family. And maybe healing is from a sickness. It comes in different ways for each and every one of us but there's still gonna be healing, whatever that may mean. 
Now, is all this going to come to us when we uh, have a one conversation with Jesus? Is that how it works? We talk to God once and all this happens. Does it? When you buy the newest phone, do you plug it in once and then the rest of your life it has power? No, right? So why do we at times pray to God once and think, I'm good. I got my uh, daily month in prayer. I'm good. I got my full juice. I'm okay. And at the end of the month, we're wondering like, oh, I'm so weak. I got beat up. I'm tired. I can't do these things. When was the last time you got plugged in and got that full power source? Imagine what that must feel like to daily commune and talk with God. There's a story I want to show you if you want to follow me. It's in the book of Daniel. There's this guy you guys might know. His name's Daniel. And he's known for something at this moment in his life. Daniel chapter 6. This is what it may look like to daily commune. Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. If you're there, say amen. Chapter 6, verse 10. Amen. Okay. Verse 10. Some backstory, actually, with this is that there's a decree going on where if you were to serve anyone but the king or pray to anyone, you'd be persecuted. So that's the backstory. Verse 10. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. Daniel is about to be persecuted. What does he do? He prays. How many times does it say he prays? Three times. That's interesting. How many times did you guys charge your phone? You guys said twice, right? At least twice. Maybe three. Maybe just plug it into your car. That counts too. But he's praying three times a day. In his good days, he prays, and they notice that. And then the days he's getting persecuted, they notice that. At the end, it says, he bowed down on his knees and prayed just as he has always done. How many people in your life can say that about you? Yeah, she always does this. She always prays. We know this about her, about him. What's he doing over there? He's praying. That's what he does. How many of your friends or your people around you can notice that about you, as I did about Daniel? Now, Daniel had a place in his house, he says, in his window, so they noticed it was always there, right? In that same place. He'd open his window, face Jerusalem, and pray. Now, Daniel had his own place in his house, and maybe you guys have some of those too. Maybe you have, maybe it's your bed. It's a little dangerous for me. If I'm in my bed, I'm just like, Lord, I'm just, uh, Amen. Whatever I said, it works, and I keep going my day. Or maybe you have like a place in, a place in the couch, or maybe it's in, outside of your house, in the backyard, the front yard, wherever. Maybe it's in your car. You have a place where you can go to pray. The cool thing is that God isn't limited to that one place in your house. He's not limited to that comfy seat, the recliner, when you pray. He's not limited to that. But we serve a very personal God, that we can connect with him in whatever way is that may mean. For me, um, I love driving. No matter where it is, I just love to be the one driving. And I pray when I'm driving. You may be asking, Miguel, how can you drive with your eyes closed? That's really hard. That's really hard. But I don't. I drive with my eyes open. And I pray. I talk to God. And I'm just going back and forth. And what I'm doing is I'm turning off the music, driving alone with nothing else playing, and waiting for him to speak. I feel at times we're in our life, we're like, Lord, please help me with this. <laughs> okay, bye. And we're leaving that time when he's not talking to us. We're, we're just going and giving and giving and giving. Our prayer life is not a monologue. It's just not one person going and talking and giving and spitting out stuff. It's a dialogue. It's two persons going back and forth. At times, we just go and then leave. We're not giving that time for Jesus to, to talk to us. Or maybe we know the answer already, and we're purposely leaving. We're like, Lord, help me just get over this job. And you know you're going to stay there for longer. You know you're, you're called there, and you want to leave. So you purposely don't hear him. But another way you can do that is through music. The praise team. 
I love it when they sing. During that time, I, used to, I take it to pray. I listen to God, whatever he has to say, I take that time to listen. I'm not the greatest singer, um, but in Psalm, I think it's 100, it says to make a joyful noise. I'm not hitting the right notes, but I'm making a noise. And God understands that. And that's all that matters, okay? You can make a noise too, that's fine. You can sing, that's okay. As long as they're playing louder than we're singing, that's okay. That's what matters. But prayer shouldn't be a scary thing. It shouldn't be a thing that we're like, ah, I have to do this every day. It's a communication. It's a being plugged in to get the power source. So I want to end on one more story. First Samuel, still in the Old Testament. We're going to be talking about two different people in here in this story. First Samuel, it's going to be in chapter 3. Now we've talked about what it means to allow Jesus into our lives. What do we do to do that? We're humbling ourselves. We're seeking him daily. We're turning away from our wickedness. But what if we're not there yet? What if we're still learning? That's okay. That's totally fine. First Samuel chapter 3. We're going to be reading a few verses. First Samuel chapter 3, verse 1. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night, Eli whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of the God was. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am. You called me. But Eli said, I didn't call you. Go back and lie down. So he went and lie down. Again, the Lord called Samuel, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am. You called me. My son, Eli said, I did not call you. Go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel a third time. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am. You called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, go and lie down, and if he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there, calling as at the other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, speak, for your servant is listening. We'll stop there. At this point, Samuel is about 11, 12 years old. He's new. He's in the temple taking care of things. And Eli is a prophet. Now, some background about Eli is he was very well known. But at this time in his life, a few chapters before this, some things happened in his life where he, he chose his family over God. And there's consequences because of that. And right now, he's dealing with those consequences. Eli, at this point in his life, he's pretty old, as you can tell. But he's chosen not to listen to God anymore. And you can see that. At the very end, it says, Eli realized the Lord was calling to the boy. Did Eli hear this voice too? And just not listen? And not say, Lord, speak? Because the chapters before, he, he did some stuff that wasn't right. And maybe he's saying, I'm not going to listen anymore. I'm choosing myself. Maybe he thought he wasn't good enough anymore. Then there's Samuel. Samuel keeps going back. To his teacher, he goes back to Eli and saying, I'm here. And he's like, I didn't call you. He's like, okay. He goes back, lay down. And he hears him again. He's like, hey, I'm here. He could have stopped after the first time if his teacher said, that's, that's not me. He could have stopped, just lay down and ignored the voice. But he kept going back to Eli and saying, I'm, I'm here, I'm ready. But it wasn't Eli that was calling him. So Samuel realizes he's talking to him, where Eli tells Samuel he's talking to him. And notice what um, Eli says to Samuel. He doesn't say, go lay down, go spit out all these things happening in your life, and tell God. Tell him all the, all the verses you memorized. Tell him all the things you learned about the temple, about the sanctuary. No. 
What does he say? He says, go lay down back to your place and give God permission to speak. He realizes, Eli knows better. And even though he's not listening to God, he knows that it's a dialogue. When we talk, we also have to listen. Sometimes it's the opposite, around, opposite way around in this story. Samuel was listening first before he talked. So in this story, there are two kinds of people. There's Samuel, who's hearing God for the first time. And then you have Eli, who knows the Lord's voice but is choosing not to listen. Isn't it great how sometimes in our life um, we're choosing not to listen to God and uh, he still sends people in our life to let us know that he's there. He's like, I'm still here. I know you're not listening to me, but I'm still here. I'm still knocking at the door. I'm still being patient. And Eli realized it's Samuel. It's time to talk. He's talking to Samuel. So where are you in life right now? Who are you? Are you Samuel? Are you wondering, I, I think I hear his voice, um, but I'm not sure. And then you're kind of going back to forth to other people when you're asking, like, is this what he sounds like? I'm not really sure. Or are you an Eli? Have you heard God's voice so many times in your life, directing where you're supposed to go, that you just stop listening? That you're saying... Lord, I know in the morning I used to have this time for you. In the evening, in my car ride, I used to talk to you, but I'm, I'm not doing that anymore. I think I know what's best for me in my life right now. I think I'm doing pretty good. I got this. And you're choosing not to listen. You're replacing that time. I want to let you know that wherever you may be today, whoever you may be, there's a simple solution. And that's giving God the permission once again to speak. That's saying, Lord, my phone is dead. Lord, I don't have any more power. Lord, that last time I was plugged in years ago. Lord, when I was a kid. Lord, a couple months ago. Lord, during that week of prayer. Whatever that may be, Lord, I think I'm out of juice. I think I'm out of energy. My battery is, is dead. That's saying, Lord, I want to be plugged back in. And like I talked about earlier, that plugging in isn't a... <laughs> How many of you charge your phones up to 5%? And then you're like, ah, it's good. Got it. Got the whole day. If you plug it to 5%, you're going to end up coming back a few moments later, right? I mean, sometimes we're impatient and we get to like 50% or 70%. Like, I got it. I got it. We're good now. Battery saving mode. Okay, we're good. And we kind of continue throughout our day. In our prayer lives, however we may be starting off, whether it's five minutes, ten minutes, it's giving that full attention, plugging in fully, and making sure that you have enough battery to continue throughout your day. And maybe you, maybe you need more. That's totally fine. That's why we have car chargers. That's why we have portable chargers. That's why we have cases to go around with our phones or cases to go around with our phones. Interesting. But today, for those who are wanting to start or restart that conversation with God, I ask that you say this with me and pray with me to say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Samuel, you want to restart that conversation, or you want to start it. If you're genuine about that, I want to ask you to stand with me. Say, Lord, I'm ready. Lord, I'm ready to, to hear your voice again. And if you're not, that's okay too. For those who are, those who are wanting to hear his voice again, I say you stand with me, we pray. See you. 
we don't know how to do it anymore. How do I, how do I pray for you? Lord, give us the courage just to start by talking to you. Give us the courage to listen to you, Lord. To seek you and not to stop, Lord. Thank you for showing us what a daily communion would look like with you, Lord. People will tend to notice. That's great too. But that's it. Thank you and I'll see you later.